This video is sponsored by Established Titles. I think on the whole, I prefer the bear. The BFG is a British animated film that released straight to television in 1989. It was directed by Brian Cosgrove, who had previously directed The Wind and the Willows from 1983, and was produced by Cosgrove Hall Films. It tells the story of a young girl named Sophie, who meets an elderly giant named the BFG, who shows her both the wonders and horrors in the world of giants offering an escape into a world full of creativity and fantasy in which dreams are quite literally made. Scenes of giants feasting upon children as they sleep at night, and an entire song dedicated to farting. Yeah, it's a real roller coaster of emotions. This was an absolute childhood favourite of mine, but it has been a good many years since I last viewed this. So is it still the awesome film that I fondly remember? Or when gazed upon with fresh adult eyes, is it a film which may have aged a little questionably? Let's jump in and take a look. Are you a massive narcissist who may or may not care about the environment? Well then I present to you established titles. Established Titles is a fun project where you can purchase yourself as little as one square foot of land in Scotland dedicated to you. Because of historic Scottish customs where landowners are referred to lords, ladies, or lairds, you too can now be referred to as a lord, lady, or laird. Even being able to officially put it on credit cards, plane tickets, and even dating profiles. Now I am gonna get all the ladies. And if anyone should dare question about your lordship, you can show off your official certificate, complete with a crest. Something which I myself now proudly own. Yeah, that's right. An Englishman now owning a piece of Scottish land? Suck it, Braveheart. But all humour aside, this project also has a really noble cause, where they will plant a tree for every order purchased to protect the pristine woodlands of Scotland, and aid in global afforestation efforts. Working in partnership with charities such as One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future. Not to mention you can also purchase this as a gift for someone else, or even get a couple pack where you can purchase adjoining pieces of land. At the moment Established Titles is having a great limited time sale, so go to establishedtitles.com forward slash Reviews to get 10% off your purchase using the discount code STEVEREVIEWS, or simply click the link in the description below. Thank you so much to Established Titles for sponsoring this video, now back to the review. The film is based on a book going by the same name, released in 1982 and written by Roald Dahl. You may have heard of him. And fun fact, of all the film adaptations that were made from Roald Dahl's books, this is one of the few that he actually enjoyed, with the film's director, Brian Cosgrove, stating, I got a lovely note back from Dahl saying it was perfect. He was right behind it, and to just get on and do it. Just do it. With there even being reports of Dow standing up and applauding the film at the end of the credits. One of the special moments for me was that when the lights came up, he stood up and, and applauded. Um, he was very pleased with our vision of his film. And this is quite a big deal, as Roald Dahl generally wasn't a fan of the film adaptations from his work, and he certainly wasn't shy about expressing that, famously being infuriated at Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. He uh, disliked, no he hated Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Going on to say how he hated some of the story changes, and the casting of Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka. And with Roald Dahl's passing in 1990, I guess it was good that the last adaptation he saw was one that he actually enjoyed. When I finished the film, we had a screening in Water Street, and I remember I sat near the door <laughs> in case he turned nasty. Though I haven't personally read the book the film is based on, I did do some research on it, and there are some elements in this film that were changed, but I'll get into those details later on. For now, 
let's take a look at the film itself. The film opens up to what I can only describe as a demonic-esque Doctor Who opening. Boy, choosing to watch this film on acid was a bit of a mistake. Fun fact, this vortex effect was done by Ben Turner, who bought a fish tank from a local pet shop and then bled paint in it whilst filming it on an overcranked 35mm film camera. We cut to an orphanage where we get introduced to a little girl named Sophie. At least I think she's a girl. In the original book, Sophie was illustrated with long blonde hair. According to Roald Dahl, he named the character after his actual granddaughter, and the film's director wanted to play homage to this, so redesigned the character in the film to look more like Dahl's granddaughter at the time. But my original design was uh, the classic long blonde haired little girl. Then I saw this photograph of his granddaughter and I changed it and we worked all the way through the film with this new design in and at the end of it he said we couldn't have bettered it. One night Sophie gets out of bed to simply look out at the night sky but upon her viewing she notices a mysterious cloaked giant walking through her town. The giant notices Sophie spying on him, and so snatches her from the bed and takes her back home with him. This is a really strong opening for the film, as we get a brief introduction into Sophie's sad life at the orphanage. Yes, miss. An immediate introduction to the BFG, who's looking awesome by the way, and the plot kicking off with the kidnapping of Sophie all within the first five minutes. Not only getting some nice animation, but also an immediate sense of tension and mystery, getting teasers to questions that will be explained to us later on in the film. All of this is coupled brilliantly with the suspenseful music. The only nitpick I have with this opening is this one shot of the BFG smirking as he captures Sophie. Given what we learn about him being a soft friendly giant later on, this shot just makes him look weirdly menacing. Once back home, we're introduced to the BFG as the big friendly giant. I is the big friendly giant. Though I don't know why he'd call himself the big friendly giant when he's literally the smallest one out of all of them. Like with Sophie, the BFG has had a bit of a redesign from the original book illustrations. And honestly, I kind of prefer it, as it gives him more detail and offers for better facial expressions. Though from certain angles, it does kind of look like he has a penis for a face. During this section, the pacing slows down as we get some exposition given to us from the BFG, as he explains the setting of giant country and the other giants living within it, telling Sophie that although the other giants will eat children, the BFG is vegetarian, though he does eat some bacon later on in the film, but shut up. This section could easily feel very boring and dragged, as there's a lot of dialogue going on with no real action or even music to fill it. But honestly, it really doesn't. Because of the sense of mystery given to us in the opening scene, and the mysterious set designs of Giant Country, you are genuinely intrigued as to how this world works. This is also aided by the vocal performance given to the BFG, who I'm only just learning now was played by the legendary Sir David Jason. Yeah, Del Boy from Only Fools and Horses. I think we're on a winner here, Shriek. All right, play it nice and cool, son. Nice and cool, you know what I mean? <laughs> I honestly would never have guessed that. And even if I was told it, I think I'd need to Google that just to be sure. He gives such a solid performance which really suits the character. <laughs> no. That coupled with the BFG's constant use of broken English makes him really entertaining to listen to. I spot what you is thinking. And then there's this terrible joke where the BFG is explaining what people taste like from across the world. Swede from Sweden is all tasting Sweden sour. <laughs> uh, take my upvote. 
We also get some backstory on Sophie as we learn that her parents died as a baby and how she now lives in a cruel orphanage. This doesn't so much make us sympathise with the character, but rather just to justify as to why it's not such a big deal that the BFG kidnapped her. Which is fine. Sophie as a character in this film isn't necessarily bad, but is just uninteresting and serves more as an audience perspective as we too learn about the world of giants along with her. Speaking of which, one of the other giants, the Blood Butler, stumbles into the BFG's home and is suspicious that he's hiding a human. It becomes clear that the other giants are far larger and far more aggressive than the BFG, and this is emphasised greatly through the use of lighting and angles used in the scene. The BFG tricks the Blood Butler into eating some foul tasting snozcumber, which accidentally results in Sophie getting eaten. The Blood Butler storms out in a rage, where it's discovered that Sophie was spat out before she got swallowed. But this results in her being covered in spit, which leads to one of the more awkward scenes in the film. Oh, yeah, not gonna lie, this scene does feel a bit weird to me. I know it's supposed to be completely innocent and all, but some of the poses she does during it just feel a little off. And watching a little girl taking a bath feels like I'm going to be put on a list somewhere. The BFG makes Sophie a new dress and we get introduced to the drink Frog Scottle, which brings us to what is arguably the most iconic part of the film. But if brothers are going down, well they might, they, they might come out some, somewhere else. Yes! You know, in any other film or TV show, if I was to hear that there was a song about farts, which featured constant farting throughout, I would think that was an awful idea. And I should be thinking that. But you know what? And I can't believe I'm saying this. It actually works. Yeah, a musical number in an animated film that does nothing to further the plot, seemingly comes out of nowhere and is entirely about farting, and I actually like it. There's a sentence you will never hear me say again, ever. Sophie? Sophie. And with that, Sophie passed away. The extreme force and velocity of air being shot out of her ass caused massive organ rupture and tissue damage. Her death was slow, agonizing, and above all, incredibly smelly. Farts and prayers. We cut to the next day where the BFG and Sophie head off to a place called Dream Country, but not before a brief encounter with the other giants. I thought he was going to kill you! No, oh, no! Only human beings that shoots and bombs and kills each other. No other animals is doing it. Alright, I'm gonna spit some hard truths here for the BFG that contains the stuff of nightmares that you wouldn't even find in Dream Country. He talks about cats not killing other cats. Well, let's take a look at one of the biggest cats of all, the lion. Male lions will wander through territories in order to find a pride. When they do, they will try to fight and kill the current male lion in order to claim the pride as their own. But it doesn't stop there. As if the pride already has cubs, the new male lion will seek out the cubs and kill them. This belated abortion not only prevents the little Simbas from one day overthrowing him, but also brings the females back into season so he can then father his own. Do you think lions have it bad? Well, some young animals aren't even safe before birth. The sand tiger shark, for example, will have the oldest fetuses in the oviduct beginning to devour the other unhatched eggs. And don't think that hatching will save you, as once those eggs run out, the larger fetuses will begin feasting upon the smaller ones, leaving only the biggest and strongest sharks to be born. Now they don't teach you that in Baby Shark. And let's finish with our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. Chimpanzees were once thought to be relatively peaceful creatures until numerous sightings witnessed them not only fighting with one another, but also killing and eating their own kind. A gang of chimps will knock out rival groups from the treetops, and if they're unfortunate enough to survive the fall, they'll be beaten and even eaten alive. 
And yeah, that includes youngsters too. This is why we pray every day that the Planet of the Apes remains a work of fiction. Thank you for tuning into this episode of National Geographic. Now back to the film. The two make it to Dream Country, where the BFG states it's his job to capture the wild dreams and have them put into bottles, where he later pours them into his pipe to deliver them to sleeping children around the world. I'll give the film credit, I just love the design of this place, and the animation given to the dream spirits themselves always looks so great to look at. Oh, Alright Sophie, in a place full of giants and magical elements, I'm surprised this is where you decide the bullshit has gone too far. Uh, Sophie, stop trying to have a character, just go back to being the audience's vessel and shut the fuck up. It's also revealed that there aren't just dreams floating about this place, but also nightmares, which again, I just love the animation that are used for these. The two then head back down to Earth, where the BFG delivers the freshly caught dreams to the children. Nice Danger Mouse reference there. And there's our second awkward instance of a young child taking a bath. The good times don't last long however, as one of the other giants, Flesh Lumpeter, arrives at the same town. How the other giants get to the human world I'm not really sure, as the BFG always seems to arrive from the sky via the Doctor Who portal, whereas this guy seems to just rise up from the sea. Also quite the coincidence that despite being able to appear anywhere in the world, he just happens to appear in the exact location as the BFG. My, how convenient. Now this is where the film's tone shifts to a much darker and action driven plot, as we see the giant sneaking through the town where it's later revealed that he went on a murderous rampage, which yes, includes the child we saw dreaming earlier, which is pretty dark thinking about it. Sophie and the BFG spot the giant wandering through the town, and though Sophie tries to stop him, the BFG decides it's best to make a run for it. And this is where Sophie's character becomes particularly unlikable. No, I is running away to save you. Yeah, I get that she's upset and all, but the BFG makes a valid point. I is never stopping him. He would just punch me down and kick me. Like, what exactly did she expect him to do here? We've seen previously at how he's dwarfed by these other giants, so if he did challenge them, he would have most likely have just gotten the shit kicked out of him. But fortunately, Sophie then comes up with a plan. I don't know, this plan just seems so left field. Like, giants are ravaging children from their homes, and Sophie's just like, Oh, I don't know, uh, let's go see the Queen, I guess. Like she's some sort of well-known superhero. The BFG drops Sophie off at Buckingham Palace, where he also delivers a specially crafted dream to the Queen to give her the backstory of what's been happening. The next morning, the Queen awakens to discover Sophie, who introduces her to the BFG. I gotta say, I think the Queen is my low-key favourite character in this film. Like, I've heard people criticise her role in this as they find her too plain and boring considering the situation going on, but I think that's what makes it so hilarious. All this wacky zany shit going on around her, and she still just sits there straight faced like it's totally normal. Oh, I'm making balls winkles. What was that? It was Louis the 15th. This has all been delivered perfectly by Angela Thorne, who's voicing her. Would you care to join us for breakfast? Oh, will it be stinky snozcumbers, Magister? I beg your pardon. You fucking what, mate? They come up with the plan that the giants are to be captured during the day whilst they are sleeping using the help of the army which the BFG guides towards Giants Country. Blimey. He's a big fella, isn't he? Despite a little bit of a hiccup, the operation goes rather smoothly, and all giants appear to be captured. That is, of course, except for one. <laughs> Ooh, 
With the lone giant easily overpowering the army, the BFG decides he's the only one who can stand up to the beast, where he promptly gets his ass kicked. See Sophie, this is why he was right to run away in the first place. Flesh Lump Eater gets distracted by Sophie's screams, and so forgets about the BFG to go chasing after her. In what is actually a pretty intense scene. Sophie is eventually captured, and just as the giant is about to eat her, the BFG returns with his dream pipe and manages to direct the nightmare potion from earlier directly into the giant's head, sending him into a fit of insanity. Apparently in the original book, this fight was slightly different. And instead, Sophie and the BFG convince Flesh Lump Eater that he's been bitten by a venomous snake, and so trick him that he needs to be tied up to prevent the venom from spreading. Honestly, I prefer the film's version better. It's less goofy, and brings the whole nightmare element we saw earlier to full circle. Plus, I love the animation and sound effect we get as he's blasted with the potion. The giants are taken away by the army and dumped into a pit where they are to be fed snozcumbers for the rest of their lives. Apparently as well in the book there's a scene where three drunken men then fall in the pit and get eaten by the giants. That sounds pretty hilarious but I can understand why they wouldn't want to include it in the film. A ceremony is held to congratulate everyone where it's revealed Sophie's old orphanage will be relocated to the palace and the old caretaker will be forced to look after the giants. I mean, from the sounds of her ill treatment of the children, I think a prison sentence would have been more suited, but whatever. Well, if you don't fold your clothes properly or something, she, she locks you in the cellar. It's not all good news, however, as the BFG states that he needs to return back home to continue his duties for capturing dreams, in which we get a pretty heartfelt goodbye from him and Sophie. Oh, BFG. I'm going to miss you so much. I is always missing you. Too. Where the film ends and the credits roll. Nah, just kidding. Sophie eventually decides that she'd rather live with the BFG, and so the two return back to Giant Country together. In the book, this was again slightly different as the BFG actually decides to stay in England. And again, I think the film has the better choice here, as him going back to continue his dream capturing duties makes much more sense where the film actually ends, and the credits roll. And that's the BFG. Does it still hold up after all these years? Yeah, I think so. The film sits around an hour and 30 minutes, but the story keeps up a decent pace that you never really feel it drag. The film has a very quick introduction, and even when the pacing slows down to give the audience some exposition, it never feels boring as the world we're thrown into is just so creative and enticing. The pace then picks back up in the second half as we get a much darker and action-driven plot, offering a lot of tension and emotion. And does a nice job incorporating the dream elements we learned earlier in the film to play a key role in the final showdown. I also really like the animation for this film. Though not quite up there with the quality of Disney and Don Bluth at the time, you gotta remember that this was intended for a direct-to-TV release, and for that, the animation is actually really good. We get some nice fluid movements and great visuals throughout, coupled with some really nice choice of angles which gives the giants their sense of scale. I do wish there was more use of dynamic lighting and shadows, as the few scenes they are utilised in look great. But again, direct-to-TV budget, so I'm not gonna knock them too hard on that one. The film also used a rotoscoping technique for some of the characters, such as the Queen. For those that don't know, rotoscoping basically means tracing over the movements of real life people, rather than drawing freehand. Think of the Take On Me music video. This technique can make the Queen's animation come across as quite stiff and limited, almost as if we're watching some 1960s Hanna-Barbera cartoon, but given her prim and proper attitude in the film, I actually think this limited animation oddly suits her. I also want to touch upon it just how gorgeous the background stills are as well. I love the designs of the dream world and the giant's world, really adding more sense of alien and mystery to the barren landscape, and all of these Aztec-like ruins as well, making you wonder if there was once a thriving civilization in giant country which collapsed, now leaving the land barren and stricken of life 
perhaps even forcing the few surviving giants to prey on humans as they search for food. I also need to give credit to the musical score, which is absolutely fantastic in this film. From the slow and suspenseful moments to build tension, to the fast action paced scenes, and the soft yet whimsical moments as we're in dream country. And then there's the two songs that are used in the film. Whiz Pop, as I mentioned earlier, is a song that I should hate, but somehow don't. And the second is a song played as Sophie floats around in Dreamland. It does kind of come out of nowhere, but given the setting, I think it works just fine. Now for a couple of nitpicks. There aren't many in this film, but my main one has to be with the character Sophie. As I mentioned earlier, Sophie doesn't really have much of a personality to herself, mainly serving as the audience's vessel and asking the questions that we're probably wondering too. Which is fine, but then the few moments they do try to give her some character, she often comes across as whiny or sarcastic. Thankfully though, these moments are minimal. And thankfully, the main star of the film, the BFG, is a lot of fun to be around. Also, a quick shout out to some of the minor characters that are also really great, such as the army generals, motherfucking Liz, and the other giants. I do kind of wish we got to see more character interactions with the other giants, as there are 9 of them and we only really get to see 2. And with all their cool looking designs, it would have been nice to have more screen time with them. Still, despite my nitpicks, after all these years I'm happy to say that I still thoroughly enjoyed this film, and would recommend you guys go check it out. Especially because as of this review's recording, it's currently free to watch on YouTube in high definition. I also want to mention that despite my love of this film, I still haven't yet seen the remake which came out in 2016. I'm tempted to give it a viewing and maybe do a comparison review of the two films. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see. But until the next one, take care.